Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Organometallics class today. Uh, start out with just a few announcements. As a reminder, Monday of next week is a holiday. It's an official script holiday, so there's no class. And instead, there is class Wednesday, where we'll have a guest lecture, normal time, normal place, from Martin Eastgate, who will be talking on catalyst activation and deactivation processes that are relevant to research uh, his team has done at DMS. And then on Friday, there'll be a guest lecture on metalloenzymes by Hans Renata from Scripps, Florida. That, um, too, will be here 10 a.m. Um, in, in CAC. Did you, are we out of handouts? Or? There's no handouts. Oh, okay. Um, and, and so class um, Wednesday and Friday next week, you'll get the second of the two problem sets next week as well, so keep an eye out for that. And then we became aware that there's a conflict with the heterocycles final in one of our classes, so we're going to adjust that, so just keep an eye out for an email um, on that. Is there anything I'm forgetting? Okay, I think that's it. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tyler for our second of two TA guest lectures. Tyler will be presenting today on CH activation, both um, focusing on sort of fundamental mechanistic aspects of CH activation and then translation into catalytic systems. So take it away, Tyler. so I don't have to worry about Florida hearing me. So today um, we're going to be talking about CH activation, which, um, as many of you know, I'm in Jin's lab, so this is something I have thought about with uh, great depth. Um, maybe he wouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, I think before we begin, it's important to really define accurately what CH activation is, because you can look in the literature... And you'll find a lot of things that are called CH activation, but strictly speaking, they're not. Okay. So if we look at a giant umbrella term of CH functionalization, there are many, many examples of converting carbon-hydrogen bonds into other things. And so I've given some exa examples here. So we have friedel crafts type chemistry of arenes, radical-type reactions, so like the hoffman loffler freytag reaction, uh, super-electrophiles, so really strong acids. They can protonate carbon-hydrogen bonds of alkanes. Uh, metal oxo, metal amido chemistry, you know, those usually involve some sort of hydrogen atom abstraction and then some recombination event. Uh, carbene and nitrine chemistry, and metallocarbene and nitrine chemistry, which is characterized by some sort of entity inserting into a carbon-hydrogen bond. And then uh, directed lithiation. And there are examples in sp2 and sp3 systems. And when we come to CH activation, the key thing here is you are discreetly forming an intermediate or product that contains a transition metal carbon bond. Okay, and that's what separates CH activation from all the other uh, really elegant chemistry that I highlighted uh, above. And so when we then look at CH activation as an umbrella term, there are certain mechanistic regimes. And these are the regimes that we're going to be talking about today. And that's how we can categorize different types of CH activation. So um, there are five, and probably more if you uh, really dig into some exotic literature. And we're only going to be talking about four today. So we're going to be talking about oxidative addition of transition metals into carbon-hydrogen bonds, electrophilic CH activation, and a very closely related process known as concerted metallation deprotonation, uh, and then sigma bond metathesis. And the fifth one I've listed is metalloradical chemistry, and I can talk about that with you afterwards, but uh, uh, for the sake of time, we don't, we're not going to discuss that today. And so the key thing that unifies uh, mechanisms one through four is you have some sort of agostic or sigma complex that actually precedes the formation of a transition metal uh, carbon uh, species. Um, there are some... Uh, Examples that don't actually form a sigma complex, but those are 
oddities rather than uh, the trends. And so one key thing I want to emphasize is that actually these four mechanisms exist on a continuum, and the type of sigma complex or gossip interaction you're forming uh, can vary quite substantially. And so if we consider all four of these, and we look at oxidative addition on the left and sigma bomb metathesis on the right, oxidative addition is usually performed with pretty nucleophilic transition metals. And in that case, your pi backbonding actually is substantially stronger than your sigma bonding. So pi backbonding is the d orbital of the transition metal filling the sigma star of your CH bond, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And when we move all the way to sigma bond metathesis, your sigma bonding contribution is substantially stronger than your pi backbonding. You cannot do pi backbonding because you will see later on that the types of transition metals that do sigma bond metathesis usually are D0. Okay, and so the key thing, the key thing is you're going from some sort of carbon hydrogen species. You have a transition metal which either uh, can insert directly and you make a new transition metal carbon, transition metal hydrogen bond, or you'll see for electrophilic and CMD type mechanisms you're just ma and a sigma bond metathesis, you're actually just making a carbon transition metal species. Um, and so this is the CH activation event. And then you can convert that sort of new bond you've made into, um, you can convert the new transition metal bond you've made into a new type of bond, and that's your functionalization step. And so the key thing here is we're taking relatively strong carbon hydrogen bonds, and we are converting them to fairly weak carbon transition metal bonds, which are about 35 kcals per mole. Okay, and so if we compare that to different types of CH bonds, um, you'll see it's actually a pretty big difference. And so I've listed here um, different bond association energies and pKa's of, of CH bonds, so we can kind of figure out what is a uh, relatively inert CH bond uh, to help us better define CH activation. So if we consider uh, carbon SP hydrogen bonds, they have about uh, a BDE of 125 kcals per mole and a pKa in water of 25. Uh, CSP2 CH bonds are 108 kcals per mole and the pKa is around 44. And then CSP3 CH bonds uh, are in a range of 96 to 101 kcals per mole, so actually pretty strong. And they have a pretty high pKa of 48 to 50 usually need very strong base to actually uh, deprotonate a carbon-hydrogen bond. And then primary are 101 kcals per mole, secondary 98 kcals per mole, and tertiary 96 kcals per mole. So what is an inert CH bond? So an inert CH bond, we can say, has a pretty high bond association energy, a pretty high pKa, and um, they have what's known as some paraffin property to them. So actually the homos and lumos of the types of molecules with these inert or strong CH bonds are actually pretty inaccessible to most reagents. And so uh, one great way to functionalize CH bonds, you do it every morning, is combustion. You need really high, um, high uh, temperatures to actually affect uh, the transformation of a carbon-hydrogen bond into something else. And so insofar as we're concerned for transition metals, there are a few trends I want to outline. So intramolecularly, uh, uh, intramolecular reactions, so directed reactions are faster and uh, uh, usually easier to carry out than intermolecular reactions. If we look at the whole periodic table, we find that it's more common for third row transition metals versus second row, and it's actually a little hard for uh, first row transition metals to affect the, functional, the transformation of a carbon hydrogen bond. Does anyone want to tell me why? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for volunteers, and if I don't get volunteers, I will cold call on you guys. I know all of your names, so does anyone want to tell me why? Zishi? If you don't know, that's okay. Anyone else? 
size? Kind of. Um, this was actually on a problem set of yours. The metal carbon bond is stronger for third row versus second row versus first row. So that's why it's pretty easy to do CH activation with third row transition metals. And you'll see a lot of examples are with platinum or iridium, so third row transition metals. And so arene CH activation is easier than primary SP3, is easier than secondary SP3, and you almost never see tertiary SP3 CH bonds doing CH activation. It's, it's pretty rare. There are some examples, but it's, it's rare. Okay, and so when we consider the driving forces for that trend, so kinetically you want to form the less sterically hindered metal carbon bond, so you're going to attack the more sterically accessible CH bond. And thermodynamically, you want to consider the strength of the carbon ion you're forming. So if you were to imagine you have some metal carbon species, if you just consider the metal cation and the carbon a carbon ion, what kind of CH bond is going to be more stable? Primary versus a, uh, the carbon ion for a primary uh, is going to be a lot more stable than the, the carbon ion for a tertiary. Okay. And so now uh, a segue into oxidative addition, I'm going to talk about some comparative processes that kind of illustrate um, some important trends. So if you consider the bond strength of dihydrogen, it's around, or it is, 104 kcals per mole. Okay. When a transition metal does oxidative addition to dihydrogen, you form two new bonds, right? You form two metal hydrogen bonds. And those metal hydrogen bonds are 60 kcals per mole. And so if we do a little enthalpic calculation here, if we do 104, which is the strength of the dihydrogen bond, minus 2 times 60, so the two new bonds are forming, you find out that you get around negative 16 kcals per mole delta H. And so this is an exothermic reaction. If we consider the case with carbon-hydrogen bonds, so let's just assume a carbon-hydrogen bond is 98 kcals per mole for an sp3. And there, this is a range, right? Okay, so when a transition metal does oxidative addition to that, you form two new bonds. A metal carbon bond, which we've already, or a metal hydrogen bond, which you've already established is 60 kcals per mole. And a new metal carbon bond, which is pretty weak, 35 kcals per mole. So the delta H here is 98 minus 95, and so that's plus 3 kcals per mole. And so that's pretty close to zero, so we're going to say this is thermoneutral and is often reversible. Defined siege activation is often a reversible event. Uh, but that does depend on the mechanism. And then just to illustrate uh, the difficulty of carbon-carbon activation, so, um, you know, ignoring the steric effects, um, if we assume a carbon-carbon bond is 85 kcals per mole and a transition metal inserts into that, you have two 35 kcal per mole bonds you formed, so the delta H here is 85 minus 70, so that's 15 kcals per mole. This is an endothermic process. Okay, so now we're going to begin with oxidative addition. Okay, so um, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly the first example of uh, oxidative addition into a CH bond, but generally it is attributed to Chat in 1965. So Chat was interested in making different zero and low valent complexes with DPME. Does anyone know what DPM DMP is? Okay. It is this by dentate ligand. Okay. So he was making different complexes with DMPE, and he found when he made the ruthenium zero species in situ, and that was either from, I don't remember if it was CO dissociation or from uh, reductive elimination of hydrogen. Uh, two very interesting things happened. So when he actually had this in situ uh, complex exposed to naphthalene, he observed oxidative addition into the naphthalene CH bond here. Does anyone know why it goes there versus the other site? So, right, there, there are two CH bonds you can imagine hitting in naphthalene. Those two. Steric. Yes. Good job, John. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, yeah, it's a steric argument. Okay. And so, uh, and when the complex was not exposed to naphthalene and was allowed to uh, interact with itself, uh, a very interesting intramolecular CSP3 
activation was observed, and you can see this very beautiful chair-like dimer that was formed. And so, you know, I want to emphasize two things here. Two, in this, in, this, in this one paper, two very important processes were observed. The intermolecular insertion into an sp2 CH bond and the intramolecular insertion into a CSP3 CH bond. Okay. And so, going back to the major frontier molecular orbital interactions that we observe with CH activation, um, I want to just show you guys, so... When we have this empty D orbital and a filled sigma CH bond, you have this interaction whereby the filled CH bond is donating electrons into the empty D orbital. Okay? So when you have a filled D orbital, you can see that the D electrons here are able to back bond into the sigma star of your CH bond. And that's very important that back bonding significantly weakens the CH bond and that makes it very prone to uh, uh, an insertion mechanism. So if we think about the requirements for oxidative addition, and I did hint that these are usually with nucleophilic metals, um, the DMPE becomes a very special ligand. And there's a key thing I do want to emphasize here. Can anyone tell me why DMPE was crucial to observing these two processes? And I'll give you a hint. If you don't have methyl here, if you have phenyl, the reaction doesn't happen. It's a better sigma yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's really, really good sigma donor. You don't have any pi back bonding contribution. If you have phenyl, you're going to have pi back bonding. Okay. So the general formula for oxidative addition of a transition metal into a CH bond I've shown here. So we have LN, M, and then X is the oxidation state. You can interact with some. Uh, alkane or arene, uh, you lose one ligand, and you form some sort of sigma complex, or you have an agostic interaction if your CH bond is already bound to something on your metal. And then you proceed to go through your oxidative addition step. And in so doing, the oxidation state of your transition metal goes up by two. Okay. So these processes are usually observed for zero valent or very low valent transition metals. And so um, the two big players in the 80s that did a lot of the really elegant mechanistic work were Bergman and Graham. Okay. So they both pretty much showed uh, the same thing back to back. So it was Bergman in 1982, and he had a, another paper in 1984, and then Graham in 1983. Okay. So Bergman was interested in rhodium and iridium-3 dihydrogen complexes. And you'll see here again we have this trimethylphosphate. You have a really good sigma donor. Um, and then Graham was interested in these uh, iridium and rhodium-1 dicarbonyl complexes. Okay. So if you take either of these and you expose them to light or heat, what happens? Cut. Yeah. So in this case, you lose CO. So that's good. What happens... In this case, with the dihydrogen. Play with H2? Yes, perfect. You lose H2. And the intermediate you get is some metal, either rhodium or iridium, in the one oxidation state. Okay. And so when you have alkane as solvent, what you actually observe is that this is not too happy, so it will proceed to begin interacting with a CH bond, and you form a sigma complex, and then you proceed to do oxidative addition here. Okay, and so that was a pretty seminal work, and that, that's pre pretty illustrative of, of, of what's going on in your oxidative addition step. And so one thing I want to mention is that it was also shown that these iridium complexes that have already undergone gone CH activation will do exchanges. So if I were to take this iridium cyclohexyl uh, hydride CP species and heat it in pentane, what's going to happen? Does anyone want to tell me? Talk to me. Because you mean exchange. Yeah, <laughs> pretty good, right? Exchanges. So uh, what about the mechanism? 
Yeah, which is a perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And so that happens pretty readily. And so. This is what is observed. Okay, and this tells us something pretty important, right? Here, the primary transition metal carbon bond is favored over the secondary. Okay, and so the mechanistic implication there is it's likely not radical, right? Because for radical reactions, tertiary is favored over secondary, and you don't really see primary for radical reactions. So Bergman did a lot of really elegant mechanistic studies into this. And so there's two things I want to discuss before we go into catalytic examples. So uh, the presence of the sigma complex, proof that you're actually forming a sigma complex, and then evidence for a concerted oxidative addition mechanism. Okay. So this work was done in 1994. So Bergman took this rhodium-1 complex, and he exposed it to, and he wanted to do a CH activation into this uh, dodeca deutero neopentane does anyone want to tell me why this is probably a good thing to do oxidative addition to um, versus, let's say, <coughs> this? Yeah, there's no beta hydrogen. Yeah. And we'll see, actually, that the same complexes that will do this oxidative addition can also do beta hydrogen uh, elimination. Um, and and what you end up getting there is a dehydrogenation. Okay. So when you take this rhodium-1 in this dodeca, exposed to this dodeca uh, deuteroneopentane in liquid krypton, and you, <laughs> you, 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 you use a flash photolysis, what you end up forming, does anyone want to tell me? You lose CO, so that's the first thing that happens. Does anyone know the... What happens here? It's very interesting. What you end up forming is this CP rhodium-1, one CO, but it's actually bound to krypton. And this, well, this is postulated. They observe um, a, a new signal appear at uh, 1946 weight numbers. Okay, and so this species rapidly will begin to decompose in the presence of that dodeca deutero neopentane and a new species which was assigned as B is observed and so this had a 1947 uh, wave number you know this shows really the power of CO as a ligand for transition metals you can you can do some really interesting spectroscopic studies and then this species will uh, rapidly decompose and you end up forming this oxidative addition complex, this rhodium-3 complex, which had already been uh, prepared by another method and that wave number was assigned as 2008 uh, wave numbers. And so uh, I've just redrawn a graph from the paper and so you know this I've labeled as A, this I've labeled as B, and this I've labeled as C. So as A, uh, as A begins to disappear B begins to appear, but then B begins to disappear, and C begins to appear. Okay. So now I'm going to discuss evidence for concerted CH oxidative addition. So Bergman did another pretty interesting study. If he took this iridium-1 CP complex and he exposed it to dodeca deuterocyclohexane or just neopentane, and he you know, shine light, you lose CO, you form this very low valent iridium-1 complex, uh, and two things were observed. You form two products. You form the oxidative addition product from neopentane, and you form the oxidative addition product from the dodeca deutero uh, cyclohexane, and you only observe 7% crossover. So that 7% crossover is pretty indicative that you're forming these two species, and they're not interconverting. You're not getting deuterium transferred to uh, your other species or your hydride transfer to your other species. Does anyone want to postulate why there's a 7% crossover seen? Anna? Okay. Teaching? Do you have any ideas? Are you asking why is there so little 
why, is why, why do we observe any crossover? Think about an alternative mechanism that could be happening. It's one word. I've written it on the board already. <laughs> So basically, there's just a there's a minor radical mechanism which is which is happening. That's the only way you can explain the the seven percent crossover. But I, I you know I wouldn't worry about that. I just found that a little interesting. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about cyclometallation. So cyclometallation is a really great way to do CH activation. A lot of the early studies, as you saw from that chat paper I discussed, uh, involve some sort of uh, cyclometallation. So some sort of Lewis basic group is bound to your transition metal, and that actually makes the oxidative addition uh, pretty easy. So um, it's known that cyclometallation is a, is a source of catalyst deactivation. So if you have this... Iridium-1 with three triphenylphosphines. And you heat this in benzene. What you observe is This species, and this was reported by Bennett, and this really exemplifies the power of directing groups. Okay, and so Whitesides was able to demonstrate cyclometallation of a platinum carbon bond to form a new platinum carbon bond. And you guys are going to help me with this. So the product of this reaction when you heat it is this. So this is white sides. Organometallics. 1982. Okay. So, what is the first step for this to happen? You're starting to the stage bound of one of those metals. Something has to happen that's the second step. <laughs> Benson? Maybe we have to lose a triphenylphosphine first. Bingo. Yep. First thing that happens is you lose triphenylphosphine. And Dong Min told us the second thing that happens. You form an agostic interaction. So after you form the agostic interaction, you do your oxidative addition. And this really, again, shows that the third row transition metals are really good at doing CH activation. Okay. Now what? 
ductive elimination. You lose neopentane. And then another triphenylphosphine comes in. And that gets you to your product. Okay, so everything I've talked about so far have been stoichiometric studies. And now I'm going to start talking about uh, some catalytic examples. Okay, so if you guys recall, a lot of the chemistry that was done with catalytic transition metal chemistry in the mid-20th century involved the insertion of carbon monoxide into various transition metal carbon bonds. And so I think it's not surprising in that case that the first example of catalytic CH activation involved the carbonylation of a CH bond. And so this was done by Eisenberg. Benzene with one ATM of carbon monoxide in the presence of catalytic rhodium-1. And it, it was Wilkinson's complex. You shine light on it, and the product you form is benzaldehyde <laughs> in three turnovers. And this was Eisenberg, organometallics, 1983. Okay. So, can anyone remind me what Wilkinson's complex is? Tristrate phosphine, Yeah. So, you can use Wilkinson's or you can use. this monocarbonyl. And so the, the, the necessity of light really shows that you need to lose triphenylphosphine or carbon monoxide from your rhodium-1 in order to do the oxidative addition and then the insertion step. Okay, so Tanaka had a, a great idea. So he recalled the power of trimethylphosphine or DMPE uh, in the activation of sp3 ch bonds and so his contribution was taking this complex and merely replacing the triphenylphosphines with trimethylphosphine and he was able to take pentane and affect the same transformation so this is i think this highlights the importance of ligand design in enabling new transformations, and hopefully that can serve as an inspiration to you guys, or just another example of things you've seen over and over again. Okay. Interestingly enough, he observed some branch product. Um, and what was really interesting, I can't really get into this, but depending on the wavelength of light you use, you can actually favor the primary versus the branch product. And the reference for that is Hamlet, 1987. Okay. Um, one of the more famous CH activation reactions is the Mirai reaction. And so this has been... Um, uh, really a, a galvanizing source in the field. And the interesting thing with the Mirai reaction is you get a pretty high yield, the conditions are really mild, and uh, you have really good functional group tolerance. And this is one of the best examples of catalytic uh, directing group enabled CH activation. So if you take this phenylmethyl ketone and you add an olefin, and I'm going to just give the example of the silo olefin because that has the, the vinyl silane that has the highest yield. And you use catalytic ruthenium ruthenium 
or this catalytic lithium, zero. Product you get is the following. in 100% yield. And so, yeah, that's pretty good, right? You guys can all see it? Okay. And so, this is Mirai, Nature, 1993, the year I was born. It was the first paper I ever read. I was like two. Uh, <laughs> all right, I got you guys laughing. Okay. <laughs> So the cool thing about this reaction is the mechanism is actually vague, and it depends on both the catalyst and the substrate you use. Okay. So I want you guys to consider a mechanism that does not invoke direct oxidative addition to a CH bond. Any ideas? For this reaction, for, for the marine reaction specifically. I'm going to start calling on my lab because Jin has lamented about this quite a bit. So, yeah, no pressure. Han, do you have any ideas? The, <laughs> the question is, can you think of a mechanism for this reaction that doesn't involve the transition metal directly doing oxidative addition into the CH bond? Do you have any ideas? I'll, I'll, how about this? I'm going to draw... Start with the thing in two. You can do sigma bond metathesis of the hydride. That is an interesting idea. You don't actually... You usually don't see that kind of sigma bond metathesis happen. But I will give you some applause because sometimes it's pretty hard to distinguish whether, whether a third row transition metal is doing oxidative addition or sigma bond metathesis. There's some cases where it's pretty murky, actually. So, but, but nice try. Okay, I'll, I'll draw this in a, in a suggestive manner, and yeah, maybe... Like hmm? Right, like attack the airing, break air into Perfect, yeah. And you only see this with pi systems. So if we just consider a case like this, the transition metal can coordinate. Now let's see. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Okay. So you form I'll give you a hint. You, you got to get that. That so P, you know this. This will do an oxidative addition formally. Yeah. So what's going to happen is this lone pair kicks down there, and the hydride migrates. Okay. Is that clear to everyone? So formally, you get this. Okay. So. Um, those are those are cases where you actually have some sort of directing group that has some sort of pi system, but you don't need to have a ketone or an aldehyde to do this kind of reaction. You can do this with alcohols. You can do this with many different directing groups, and those are cases where you probably just have oxidative addition happening. Okay, so perhaps the most famous uh, example of catalytic oxidative addition involves the direct correlation of CH bonds. And so that was some really elegant work by Hartwig and Smith. And so Hartwig first demonstrated the stoichiometric borrelation of pentane with tungsten. 
So. Using these catacall borings. Okay. When you shine light on this, in the presence of pentane, what you get in 83%, and this is stoichiometric, what you get in 83% yield is this borelated product, and this is Hartwig Science 1997. Okay, now why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because this is like the second case of doing oxidative, or this is the first case of doing oxidative addition to an sp3 CH bond and then functionalizing it in some capacity. Okay. So shortly thereafter, Smith demonstrated the first catalytic example. All right, and I'm just going to draw that for you guys. Using catalytic iridium one, uh, 3. Once again, we see this trimethylphosphine appearing and being pretty paramount to sp3CH activation. And interestingly enough, this, this CH activation was done on cyclohexane. It was 150 degrees for five days. And the product you get is this alkyl borane. And this was Smith. And Hartwig followed up with that, and he demonstrated you can take B2 pin 2 and do catalytic CH activation using rhodium 1. So if you take two of these alkanes, with this rhodium 1, Olefin complex. You get plus hydrogen, and this is an eighty five percent yield. Okay, I should mention this is eighty three percent. Okay, and this was Hartwig. Also, science 2000. Okay. So, what was pretty interesting was when they did the same reaction with iridium 1, so they prepared the same complex, but it's iridium 1, the yield is 58%. At five days. Does anyone want to tell me why? Luke? Do you have any ideas? So, rhodium gives higher yield in a shorter time. Iridium takes a lot longer, and you don't get even close to the same yield. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, so the. <laughs> The iridium carbon bond is a little too strong, so that functionalization step becomes too hard. So sometimes you actually don't really want a strong transition metal carbon bond because then you can't really do anything with it. Okay, um, and on the problem set, I'm going to have you guys look into and think about whether these kinds of reactions go through an iridium-5, which is pretty interesting, or an iridium-3 type mechanism. And there's some evidence that it could do either. So I'm just going to give you one example here. This is a mechanistic study by Hartwig. So 
So if you take this iridium-5 or this iridium-1, get the same product and the same yield. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to be moving on to the next section, which is electrophilic CH activation. And so this does not involve the use of low valent transition metals, but rather high valent transition metals. And again, the reason being, you don't always need to populate the sigma star. Sometimes the transition metal coordinating the CH bond is sufficient to induce a cleavage event. Okay. So... The Paramount studies were done by Shilov, and Shilov was originally interested in 1972 in the reductive elimination of platinum-2 alkane species, platinum-0 plus... Okay. So, uh, Shilov did some very interesting work. He took methane plus D2O, the stoichiometric amount of potassium for a platinate. At 120 degrees Celsius, he formed this. Okay. This is really cool because methane has the strongest CH bond. The other interesting thing about methane is it's really hard to polarize methane. Methane is the most nonpolar alkane, and so differentiating or inducing some sort of electrostatic bias to actually approach a CH bond is, is really quite challenging. And so I want you guys to contrast this to the nucleophilic nature of transition metals that are performing oxidative addition. Um, this is also a pretty mild condition for the deuteration of methane. And so you can imagine why um, this is important, because you can imagine if you were able to take methane and oxidize it selectively, you could actually make methanol. And methanol, as we learned, is really important. Methanol is like a, a really critical feedstock for the formation of acetic acid or you know, various products. And so... Uh, the big thing with Shilov chemistry is you can directly take methane and you can convert it to methanol. Okay. And so I just want to illustrate why that's so critical. So uh, methane plus water. This is, this is how you actually make methanol now. It's not a great process. So this is, this is steam reforming. So the steam reforming of methane will form carbon monoxide plus three hydrogen, dihydrogen molecules. Okay. This is syngas. If anyone remembers from hydroformylation, syngas you see quite often. Okay. But if you can take methane with just oxygen, you could in principle directly make this, and this is done. This is called partial oxidation. And the ratio here is carbon monoxide to two hydrogen. And when you take this and you do Fischer-Trope chemistry, which is heterogeneous in nature, you form methanol. And this is done on, on scale in Africa. This is known as the Sassel process. Okay. So... It's a pretty roundabout way, and that's because if you want to try to do anything to methane, the immediate product, methanol, 
or formaldehyde is a lot more reactive than the methane. So this is the big problem with doing methane CH activation and converting it to methanol. Methanol CH bonds are a lot more reactive. Um, and so figuring out a way to directly convert methane to methanol has been one of the central challenges of CH activation. This is why it's garnered so much attention. And I just want to mention that you can, you can view the field as being kind of uh, bifurcated. You have people that are more interested in industrial processes like methane oxidation and then more synthetic applications, which we'll see when we move on to uh, the CMD type chemistry. Okay. So, yeah, this is a central problem. How do you get from methane to methanol? And actually, um, if you were to just imagine taking methane plus one-half oxygen, converting it to methanol, heat of formation for this is negative 30.7 kcals per mole. So it's actually favored. But the problem is the methanol will just start to react. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the mechanism of the Shilov chemistry in which you are actually forming methanol from methane. Okay. So, the key thing here is during your CH activation event, the oxidation state of your transition metal does not change. Okay. So. Methane comes in. Lose HCl. Okay. Can anyone tell me how this is happening? Electrophilic siege activation section, but that's okay. One minute, you know? Nick? Yeah, that's right. And then it's like a coordination of signal point as a neutral ligand. And then what? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Right? Isn't that it's cool, right? Okay. Yeah. The chloride actually begins to abstract that the hydrogen, and that's because you've really weakened that CH bond. So what you this is the key step. Chloride plucks off that hydrogen, and this goes from L type to X type. And so that's how you get to here. Okay. Now, in these cases, when you're using that uh, potassium tetrachloroplatinate, that can actually serve as an oxidant in this reaction. So you have now some oxidation. So this platinum 4 can get reduced to platinum 2. Can you form this platinum 4? Now, what's believed to happen is you have chloride taking hydrogen from water or proton from water, <clears throat> and then that hydroxide will attack the carbon-platinum bond 
in an SN2 type fashion, uh, an outer sphere mechanism, and that gets directly back to your platinum 2 species. Okay, so again, the key thing here is there's no change in the metal oxidation state. So the most critical uh, modification of this chemistry actually comes from our Scripps colleague, uh, Periana. And so the thing I want to mention here is this is uh, one of the catalytic examples of the Shilov type chemistry. If you take methane and sulfuric acid, a solvent, and you heat it with this, this pyrimidine ligand, in the presence of your platinum 2, so it's going to coordinate platinum 2. What you get is this methyl bisulfate. Plus water, plus sulfur dioxide. And that indicates that you know this is also serving as the oxidant for this reaction. This, this can oxidize the platinum 2 to platinum 4. Okay, so this ligand is very interesting. and uh, It's not believed, actually, that the ligand or the active catalyst is actually this. Okay, what's going to happen when I have this in the presence of sulfuric acid? What's really cool is actually this, this, this pyrimidine ligand is completely stable in sulfuric acid, but something happens to it, which makes the platinum really, really reactive. Yeah, perfect, yeah. What actually happens is the active species is believed to be doubly protonated. Okay, so that makes the platinum really electrophilic, and then you can do the, the chemistry I just showed you above. Okay, so very closely related work, which will serve as a great segue into the, the third mechanism but still is categorized under the second mechanism, is the Fujiwara reaction. So the Fujiwara reaction is the direct olefination of airing. Okay. When you have an electron-rich arene, which is the easiest for the Fujiwara reaction, there's a really good Wikipedia page on that, by the way, if any of you want to learn more about the Fujiwara reaction. When you have a pretty electron-rich arene and you have palladium-2, First thing that happens is the arene coordinates the palladium 2 in an 8 to 6 fashion. Okay. And you have a reaction whereby the arene reacts with palladium and you form. This, an anion which you lost in the process of forming this Wieland intermediate, extracts proton, you lose XH. Oftentimes, this will be acetate, it can be chloride. And, you know, this should just be pretty familiar. It's just like an electrophilic reaction of an arene. Okay. And then olefin can insert. Basically, 
Now this this part here is just head chemistry. Okay. So again, I said that this works best for electron donating areas, and that's because. Those can best stabilize the Wheelan intermediate that you form, which is right here. Okay. So, what happens if you can't form a Wheelan intermediate? And you have a very electron deficient area. Well, actually, we have to consider a third mechanism. And so, that mechanism will be concerted metallation. Protonation. And this is like the hot topic in siege activation now. I think, like, okay, I want to say like 80% of all siege activation papers, maybe even 90%, use some sort of concerted metallation deprotonation. That's everything that goes on in the third floor lab, also. Well, almost everything. There are some, some cases where that's not happening. But, um, okay, so if we consider pentafluorobenzene if we take pentafluorobenzene and we expose it to palladium-2 that's right, L for ligand uh, you can't form a Wieland intermediate. And so you're not going to have some electrophilic attack from the arene to palladium, or nucleophilic attack from the arene to an electrophilic palladium. What happens is Basically, the palladium is coordinating your CH bond. So this is the sigma complex you're forming. And it's primarily sigma bond of the CH donating into an empty D orbital. And so now what happens is some base, which is, let's say it's L, bound to the metal, actually is responsible for the loss of this proton and the formation of the new palladium carbon bond. So, yeah, let me draw that in green. Okay. And what you form is general way to think about this is you have a metal with some appended base and some CH bond. And what you're forming is a new metal carbon bond and the proton ends up on that appended base. Okay. So these types of reactions are, there are so many examples, and so it's really hard to do this justice, but I'll try my best. And so the thing I want to tell you is that uh, a lot of this chemistry is done with directing groups. It's considerably easier to use directing groups because, A, you don't have that entropic penalty, but B, also, uh, the directing group allows you to actually differentiate otherwise sterically and electronically very similar CH bonds. So I think one of the most illustrative examples is 2-phenylpyridine. You take 2-phenylpyridine and many, many different metals. And you get this. Okay. And I want to give one example from Jin's lab. So this is the first, uh, this is Jin's first paper. 
So Jen took this chiral oxazoline A lot of really great mechanistic work on this topic was done by Keith Fagnew, who has now passed away. Um, he was a real leader of the field in the early 2000s. And so, what is believed to be happening in both the SP2 and the SP3 systems is, follows this general mechanism. Okay. Let's imagine we have some dimethylamine directing group. And we add, for the sake of simplicity, we'll just use palladium acetate. Transition state is believed to be something like this. So this is a six-member transition state. And this was computational work. OK. The product you get is So in almost all cases uh, for cyclometallation, you will observe and you can compete between a five or a six-membered uh, cyclometallated species. You'll get the five-membered. Does anyone know why? Um, think about geometry of the transition metals. How about you guys discuss amongst yourselves while I put up this reference and catch my breath? <laughs> okay.
third scene. <laughs> okay. Any ideas? Yes. Okay, let me ask you another question. So that's right. Why don't you form four-membered metallocycles? Because they make carbon and so happy. Very good. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's just because... Optimized geometry for a square planar palladium platinum is 90 degrees. Okay, so that's why you would hit the delta versus the epsilon siege bond, and that's why if you had a system where you had a primary beta siege bond, it'd be pretty hard to hit from some sort of coordinating functionality there. Hmm? Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. All right. So, um, one thing I want to talk about because it's um, near and dear to my heart and it goes on upstairs is doing an antioselective uh, CH activation. So, a lot of an antioselective, but not all CH activation, does use some sort of CMD type mechanism. Um, and one of the key findings there was actually uh, it doesn't get enough credit, and so it comes from Russia. And this, this I think, highlights, and same case for Shilov, um, how the geopolitical climate can really affect the, the sharing of ideas. And so um, a lot of people didn't know about Shilov's chemistry when it first came out. But anyway, what I want to talk about quickly is this idea of using chiral ligands for an antioselective CH activation. And the first example comes from Russia, from Sokolov. And he was interested in taking ferrocene Ferrocene has the dimethylamine appended off of it. Imagine you have these two CH bonds. If you were to hit this one, you'd form, and, and functionalize it, you'd form some product that has chirality that corresponds to S, so we're going to call this pro S. And this one we're going to call pro R. Okay. So, Sokolov found that you can actually make chiral platycycles if you use N acyl amino acids. And so he used N acyl amino acids, various N acyl amino acids. He didn't get high E for this, but it's nevertheless the first example. And it was in methanol, and they found. Um, a really uh, critical pH dependence for this reaction. The palladium dichloride. I think the E was like 10%. Is that right, Kieran? It's really low. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. But I think the highest was like 10. Actually, Kiri has a great review on this. I'm gonna I'm gonna write on the board if you give me a second. Okay. So they found this, and you can read more about this. Um, Kiri's review and pure applied chemistry. And the original report
And then a journal I cannot access. I tried really hard. Because it comes all the way from back in the USSR. That one was just a review, I think. You, think you, found, you found this? So what they do in the, these journals, they, it's just like a, a collection of conference articles. So okay. they present what they've already published. So I think it's just, it's not really anything new. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> That's actually very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, this kind of chemistry motivated uh, the U Lab, and so um, you know, this is really powerful because you can imagine when you make a transition metal carbon bond and you use a chiral ligand, when you take a carbon-hydrogen bond and you convert it into a transition metal carbon bond and use a chiral ligand, you're making a chiral organometallic fragment. And that chiral organometallic fragment can be transformed into many different things. And it turns out that the CMD type mechanism, the CMD approach to CH activation is very mild. So there's many different catalytic cycles and transformations and substrates and CH bonds you can do this kind of chemistry on. And so, um, just to highlight that, if you have something like this, where this is prochiral, of a ligand, a bidentate ligand, can actually form a chiral organometallic reagent. And so the, this enantioselective methylene CH activation was achieved by uh, Jin's lab a few years ago. Okay, uh, one more closely related mechanism, which it kind of bears some similarities to CMD, but is sufficiently different, is 1-2 addition. So that work was done by Bergman and Wolkonski. And the first authors of these two papers turn out to be uh, Kit Cummins and Pat Walsh. So this was like a great reaction to do to get a, a good career going. Okay. So this was done with zirconium cyclohexyl species. is another example of methane CH activation. Okay. The product you get from this reaction is you guys to discuss for five minutes, or a few minutes, um, the mechanism for this reaction amongst yourselves. It's a CH activation. That's the big hint. <laughs> Ideas? 
strong. Do you have any ideas? to addition, and what happens is hydrogen here gets on your cyclohexane. You lose cyclohexane, and just as Tanner said, you form a zirconium mito. And then methane comes in, you have a four member transition state like this. It's just like CMD. You, know, you have some sort of ligand bound to your metal. It's taking away the proton, and that gets you to your product. Okay, and so with the remaining time, I'm going to go through... Actually, it's perfect. I'm going to go through a sigma bond metathesis, um, which is really wild stuff. Um, and I hope... I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, and many of the complexes that actually carry out sigma bond metathesis do some reactions we have seen before, or I think we have, uh, but we will definitely see later on. Okay, so sigma bond. So in this kind of reaction, you have some sort of metal alkyl plus some other alkane reversibly forming a new metal alkyl and a new alkane. And an example comes from Watson. This is Jack's 1983. in which the di-cyclopentodienyl of this di-CP star of scandium or lutetium with this radio-labeled methane forms Okay, so what's happening here is the following. Because we can't invoke any of the previous kind of backbonding of a d orbital into a sigma star that we talked about before. What actually happens is something like this. This is the transition state. This is a kite-like transition state. The metal is actually quite far away from the hydrogen, and so there's really no interaction here. And so before this kind of thing happens, so what you actually get is Just talk about scandium for a second. You do have coordination of the metal CH bond or the carbon CH bond to your metal. And what effect does that have? Well, it occupies a coordination site on this 
scandium, but actually it really acidifies the CH bond. So you can view this as acidic. You can view this as basic. And so going to this, you can just imagine it's like the proton is protonating the metal carbon bond. Okay. And so you'll notice many of the same types of complexes that can carry out this reaction uh, do ziegler nada catalysis, and so, or do olefin, other types of olefin polymerization. And so, uh, Don Tilly was one of the first people to demonstrate catalytic application of this. And so, this is pretty cool. You can take methane plus propene with catalytic. P star 2, scandium, and you formally are adding methane across the propane, the propene olefin. And this was Tilly, Jax, 1, 2, 5. Uh, another pretty interesting example, also from the Tilly lab, is the silation of methane. The mechanism of this is, is pretty interesting because they're also forming hydrogen, and they found out that actually one of the species, one of the catalytic species, which is on cycle, is this cyclometallated scandium. And you can imagine methane doing a sigma bond metathesis with this to re to have hydrogen add back onto that and to form a new scandium methyl bond. Okay. And so the last thing I want to talk about is a an application of this kind of chemistry in heterogeneous catalysis. And I was unaware of this at the time of preparing these lecture notes, and I found this really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of unexplored potential here. Okay. So, using sigma bond metathesis, you can take butane and split it into methane and propane. And a one to one ratio. And this is using a tantalum hydride, which is on a solid support. I'm going to show you guys the mechanism first. This is SA science. I don't have the year. I think it's 2013, but I have to check. Okay. So what happens here is this tantalum hydride first does a sigma bond metathesis with butane. You lose hydrogen. And you form this tantalum
Why have I been saying butane? Ethane. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Ethane. Ethane comes in again. sigma bond metathesis, and this is actually a CC activation. Lose propane. Tantalum. Ethane comes in. is how you can convert ethane into methane and propane. And that's all solid support. And I believe, yeah, it's 11.33, so that's all I'm going to talk about today. If you guys have any questions, you can ask me after class. If anything was unclear, I'll be happy to 